All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Augmented World Expo 2013. Everybody happy to be here, finally? <laughs> All right. Uh, my name is Patrick O'Shaughnessy. Uh, today's uh, tutorial on mobile AR SDK. Um, and um, a couple notes, uh, the video, the uh, session will be uh, recorded, so uh, enthusiastic applause is appreciated at any point. Um, uh, there will be time for questions between presenters, uh, about five minutes in between presenters, uh, but try to hold your questions till the end of each presenter's talk. Uh, we have a lot of material to get through. Uh, we're going to try and keep it to the time limits. Um, and with that, uh, I guess we'll get rolling. Um, so my name is Patrick O'Shaughnessy, and I am the founder of Patched Reality. We are an independent uh, custom augmented reality software development company. Uh, we've been around for a little over four years, worked with many of the various uh, SDKs, starting with Flash and using FLAR Toolkit um, to Mateo and Vuforia. And I'll be giving you um, a flavor of what it is to uh, develop uh, for AR for, uh, for mobile using the various SDKs. Um, also, we have uh, an esteemed panel of uh, vendors of SDKs that are going to give their own uh, tutorials and uh, technical information. Um, just to get a level set for the room, who here actually uh, has developed uh, augmented reality before? All right. And how many people who have, of, of the people that, uh, how many people here are actually developers? Pretty good. Okay, good, good, good. All right, great. So the, the session is going to be pretty technical, so bear with us. All right. So what's the purpose of an AR SDK? I'm just going to start simple. Uh, basically, an AR SDK uh, provides uh, one, of the, one of the or more of the following. So the first thing it will provide you is uh, recognition. It'll try, try and figure out what, what to track um, based on uh, uh, pre-trained you know, uh, pre -trained, uh, or uh, live data. And then it's going to tell you uh, where that thing that you're tracking is. It'll give you a 3D pose, and that's one of the most important things that an AR SDK does. Um, and then the, the last thing is uh, sometimes, uh, and very often, it'll provide you a rendering component, or it'll tie in with a third-party component that provides the rendering, which is the content and the fun stuff uh, that gets put out in the world. Um, so that, in a nutshell, is what uh, an AR SDK gives you. And then you, as the application developer, get to fill in the blanks with what do I want to track, what type of tracking do I want to use, and what's the content and interactions I want to provide to the user based on uh, the experience design. Uh, so here's a, a spattering of various uh, tracking types. Um, and uh, the, the, it starts, you know, starts with, traditionally there was uh, GPS and sensor tracking. You probably all saw, seen the Yelp monocle or, uh, or, or um, uh, Mateo's um, uh, Junio or Layar, and that's where you're waving your phone around and you're seeing points of interest in the distance, for instance. Uh, then we get to marker tracking, which is more of a fiducial black and white type of uh, marker, or in the case of Qualcomm, they have uh, these frame markers, um, but it's more of a, a, uh, a predefined, uh, simple, simple imagery. Uh, more, more recently, uh, especially in brand engagements, people are interested in what's called NFT, natural feature tracking, or image tracking, and that's where you're tracking uh, more of a natural looking image of something, a photo, a side of a cereal box, um, something like that. And that can be either pre-trained, so you know exactly what you're going to track starting out, um, uh, or you can use a cloud recognition where you're going out to a network server and saying, um, you know, there's, here's some images coming from the device. Tell me if you recognize any of it. If so, uh, pull back a tracking profile so I can track and, and provide content. <coughs> and then uh, there's user-defined if, if you're actually uh, on the, uh, if you let the user decide what they want to track. They just take a photo uh, of something uh, in their environment, and then you lay AR content on that. Uh, then we get to 3D, uh, in either pre-trained or uh, what's called SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping, um, where you're actually tracking a 3D space as opposed to a flat 2D image. Uh, so like a, a statue or, or the, a model of a city, something like that. Um, and then, you know, of course, face, fingers, body, the human. Um, not as much of that going on in mobile, but some of it. 
Um, and then uh, robots, you can track robots. If you've ever seen Sphero, that's, that's a fun toy that tracks a robot around a room. So that's just a flavor of the different tracking types. And that's not a comprehensive list, but it's uh, pretty typical for mobile applications. So here we get to, I don't know why my slide's cut off here. Uh, okay. So this is uh, a list of, uh, we're calling the short list, of mobile SDKs and the various features uh, that they provide. Um, and I, I, the main takeaway from this slide and the next slide are that there's really not one SDK at the moment that's a sort of one-size-fits-all type of uh, arrangement. So they all uh, tend to be good uh, for some things, uh, suitable for some things. So for instance, um, and I'll talk about the columns here, uh, the purpose is, is you know, what, 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 is, what purpose does it serve? Generally, what type of tracking does it provide? Um, and then also, um, what platforms does it uh, support? Uh, these days, uh, at least, you know, if you're, if you're a company like myself, uh, you tend to get clients who want to do both iOS and Android. I suppose eventually people want to do Windows Phone as well. Um, and then uh, in terms of graphics, uh, you'll notice a common theme here. A lot of the SDKs support Unity 3D, and all the tutorials I'll be doing today are Unity 3D, so you can kind of see in apples to apples how the different vendors approach uh, an SDK for Unity. Um, or, uh, and very often, uh, the vendor will provide an alternative, usually OpenGL, straight, straight up, or their own rendering t toolkit. Uh, and then whether or not, this is whether or not they, pr they can actually do cloud recognition, and whether they have a GPS-based tracking. Uh, licensing fees are over here. Uh, so, again, different t toolkits tend to be uh, better for some things and uh, not so great at others. Um, most of them tend to do NFT these, these days. Um, there are some specialized toolkits, uh, I think on the next slide here, for instance, like Obvious Engine can track cylindrical objects like, uh, like a bottle. Um, and then there's uh, s a couple implementations of SLAM uh, that I'm familiar with anyway, one from Mateo, one from uh, 13th Lab, both of whom are represented today. Uh, so uh, I guess I'll take one question. Does anybody have a question about this slide in particular before I go? No, okay, let's go on. All right, let's go back to the... I'm sorry, Patrick? Yeah. Can you show the bottom half or the last um, half of the SDKs? Good. You want to get a picture? All right. I'll be, some, I'll providing the, be providing the slides afterward on SlideShare or something like that. Uh, okay, let's, let's see if I go to the SlideShare. Okay, so let's just talk about uh, what uh, an, a typical on-ramp is like for when you're, when you're doing an um, AR SDK, when you're using an AR SDK. I mean, the first thing you're going to do is download it and kick the tires. So what you'll do is you'll, uh, first, first you'll set up your dev environment, which you may are, have already set up to a large degree anyway if you're doing mobile development. Uh, it's the standard stuff. You need your Xcode for iOS. You need your Eclipse um, uh, or IntelliJ for Android then you need your SDK and your NDK. And then if you're doing Unity-based um, rendering, you will need Unity 3D. You'll generally need a pro license with uh, iOS and uh, Android uh, for most of the SDKs. Um, so you'll download the SDK, you'll install, run a few samples, you'll say, okay, I got dial tone, I know this thing is, I got my system set up and running the way I need it to. Um, and then, once you've done that, you're probably going to want to clean the slate and, and start from scratch and build the project the way you want it to be built. So you're going to create a new project, for instance, in Unity. You're going to wire up the SDK. And th what that generally entails is adding um, a specific AR camera that's just going to be uh, tracking uh, the environment. Um, you'll set up some licensing generally. Uh, not all toolkits require uh, some form of uh, license, but uh, most do. And you set up your recognition and tracking configuration through an online tool or a command line. Add that to your scene. And then you'll start adding the fun stuff, the content, the interactions, the things that are out in the world. Build, run, test, rinse, repeat, and then ship it. Um, so that's, you know, in a nutshell, what it is. And so I'm going to kind of run through that process for a couple of the SDKs. Uh, the first one being AR Toolkit. So I'm going to switch over here to... Uh, Unity, and I have a, a brand new project here. Uh, 
that all I've added to at this point is a is a FPS counter. Uh, it's got your main camera. Who here has used Unity before, by the way? Just okay. So this will be a little introduction to Unity as well for some people. Uh, okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to import what's called a package. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to import a custom package. In this case, I'm actually going to import an AR toolkit package. Oops. Go back here. Do, do, do. Uh, Okay, and this package contains pretty much everything that you need to uh, use the AR toolkit uh, for Unity. Um, and so you just, I'm just going to import all this stuff, and that's going to come into my my project down here after a little little waiting. Let's compile some scripts, etc. Um, one thing I will note before I go on is uh, I did do some pre setup before uh, to the build settings of this project. Then when you create a new project, it's, uh, it's set up for PC. Uh, you have to go down here, click on iOS, click the switch platform button here, and then you're, uh, you're set to, uh, to uh, target iOS. Um, that's uh, one thing to note. Uh, I guess I'll throw that out here now, is one, one reason that I personally, as a developer, like the Unity environment is, uh, generally speaking, you can target both iOS and Android with changing very little to none of of the content of what you're doing. Um, now I say little to none because if you actually have to use something native to the phone, like uh, um, uh, you know, like the um, so let's say uh, for iOS you need to tie in with uh, the, their specific notifications, then you're probably going to go to a plugin. In which case you have plugin for each platform that's native. But by and large, most of the interaction content rendering, all that stays the same, and all you have to do is switch platform, build for the other environment, and you're done. Um, now, not quite as simple as that, but anyway, it's, it's much nicer than having to build everything from scratch, put it that way. Um, okay, the other thing uh, I'll note on this is in my uh, player settings, in the build settings, I click this player settings here, um, uh, and that's off screen, isn't it? There we go. Uh, okay, uh, one thing, uh, the, the important things to fill out are uh, the company name, the product name, and uh, the, under the other settings, very important, you have to have a bundle identifier. This is your iOS, excuse me, your iOS bundle identifier. If you don't have one of those, um, and in the case of toolkits that require licensing, this is what they usually key off of to know that you have a valid license. Okay. Uh, <coughs> You want to make sure that you're uh, you're targeting the, the device the device families that you want. Um, you also uh, want to make sure that it's the orient uh, the uh, orientation that you want. So, for instance, here uh, I tend to use landscape left. Um, some of the toolkits support r auto rotation, some don't. I'm not going to go specifically into which which is which at this presentation, but. Just keep bear that in mind when you're building your project. You've got to make sure that you're using an orientation that's supported. I think that's all I wanted to say about the boilerplate settings, and they'll be pretty much the same for all the projects I'm going to show today. So, so what's the next thing we do? I've got my, my Unity package, I mean, uh, imported. Now I'm going to add an AR toolkit script to an empty game object. So I'm going to create an empty game object here that's going to show up in my scene. Uh, I, I like to put all my game objects at the origin when I... Uh, create them, at least the ones that are just script dummies. Um, I'm going to rename that AR Toolkit. And then I'm going to find uh, a, a script that, they, that AR Toolkit provides uh, called AR Toolkit. I'm going to add that to my empty game object. And that's going to give me the capability now to, to instantiate the AR Toolkit uh, library. Um, there's a little bit of uh, video config that needs to be done for AR Toolkit. Um, let's see here. For iOS, I've found um, this is uh, one of the fine things you'll find with AR Toolkit. It's a little more text, uh, text uh, oriented, a command line, that sort of thing, than some of the other ones. So I'm going to put this in here. 720p. That'll that'll give me on my iPhone 5 the full screen resolution. Um, and actually, I need to talk to AR Toolkit to find out uh, 
how to make this so that it's auto detecting because all the other toolkits tend to auto detect. What I found with AIR toolkit is you kind of have to hard code up front what video resolution you're, you're targeting. Okay, so now that I've got that set up, the next thing I'm going to do on my cheat sheets here. Um, oh, yeah. I'm going to create some, for, some layers. So the way AIR toolkit works is um, it, uh, it has a, one camera that's the video background of the world like what's out in the world. And then it's got another camera that's set up that is showing you the content that is being overlaid on the world. And we're going to set up that camera to only show us the augmented con content so that when there's no tracking image in the, in the frame, uh, then no, no content in that uh, will, will show up, just the video background. Um, so we're going to create a couple layers. And we're going to call them AR foreground and AR background, okay? Uh, and then uh, I'm going to set the layer for the AR toolkit to the AR background. So this is, this is the object that's gonna be providing the video back, uh, backdrop. Uh, next, I'm gonna create uh, an NFT data set, a natural feature tracking data set off of an image. And the image I'll be using today is actually an image that Qualcomm provides with their toolkit. It's just a picture of some pretty pebbles and stones. Uh, and the reason I'm using this is just so it's an apples to apples across all the toolkits. Also, this is a very feature rich image. It works really well uh, for most of the natural feature tracking toolkits. Uh, and so, anyway, so I've got an image. And what I'm going to do, I've got a JPEG of that image. I run a, t a command line tool called gen text data. And uh, I'm not going to run through all the features here, but basically it prompts you for a bunch of things. It asks you for the minimum resolution that you want, like I'll put 25, the maximum resolution. What it's going to do is it's going to generate um, a number of images at different resolutions uh, so that it helps it with the, with the recognition. Um, and then it'll spit out some three, three files. Uh, I'm actually just going to move to another window because I actually already have these files. It takes a little while. Um, so I'm going to go over to my boilerplate here. And I'm going to grab the three files that it creates. It creates a, a feature, two feature set files and an image set file. And we're just going to drag that into our project. I'm going to drag that into the streaming assets. Um, and those are the assets that get pulled onto the phone that the phone can access. Uh, and I'm going to delete the uh, default ones that um, the AR Toolkit provided for us. It's a nice picture of Gibraltar. Uh, okay, so I've got my image set trained. So now AR Toolkit's ready to, uh, to, uh, to look at... Uh, uh, now it knows all the features, that, feature points that are in that image. So when it's looking at the, uh, the live video, it can match the live video to those features and hopefully give us a really nice pose. All right, so the next thing I'm going to do is add a marker, uh, a, uh, a marker script to the AR, tools, uh, AR Toolkit object. So I'm going to look for uh, da -da, marker. Oh, yeah, actually, I'll just do it through the... They, uh, they provide a command... A, um, uh, a uh, drop-down menu option for, for most of the things in AR Toolkit. So I'm going to add the marker script right there. Okay. And so that marker script uh, is going to tell AR Toolkit what it's looking for. And just I'm going to choose NFT because that's the type of tracking I'm doing. Uh, AR Toolkit also can do fiducial markers. I talked about that before. That was what it was traditionally built for, uh, was these black and white markers with a black border around them. Today we're going to do NFT. And then uh, I'm going to type in the tracking image, which is called stones, into both the tag and the NFT data set name. All right, getting there. Now, what are we going to, oh, now we need a tracked camera. That's right. Okay. So we're going to add a tracked camera to our, to our Unity camera. Uh, camera is an overloaded term when you're doing AR. <laughs> uh, there's the camera that's the virtual camera, and then there's the camera which is the camera camera. Um, so hopefully not confusing with the use of the word camera. But I'm going to add a tracked camera script here to my main camera. 
Okay. So this is the camera that's going to kind of swing around and look at our scene uh, from the right angle based on what AR Toolkit's telling, telling us about the scene, about the, the world. Then I'm going to set the marker tag in that camera as well to stones. So, the, so it's looking at the stones. Um, and then, do to do, do, oh yes. So, uh, in, in Unity, each, um, each camera can, has what's called a culling mask. And that tells Unity which, which layers of content does this camera render. In this case, I'm going to first clear that out, and then I'm going to set it to uh, AR foreground. So th what that means is that this camera is looking for anything that's in the AR foreground layer that we set up earlier. Okay? Uh, and so uh, the next thing is I'm going to create uh, a, a, common, uh, a common object for our scene route, uh, our AR scene. And I'm going to pull the... Um, <laughs> Uh, the AR content, uh, I'm sorry, the um, track camera into there. That's this guy. I'm going to pull this track camera into the scene route. And then now, now comes, now that I've got all this set up, <laughs> finally, uh, I can actually put some content in there that, that I want to display. So that's where this comes in. I've created this prefab, uh, another nice feature of Unity. You can, you can bundle up... Uh, uh, scene objects that you've created up here and in your in your scene, and and pull them into your um, pull them into your project uh, either from another developer or from a, uh, an artist. Uh, oh, and actually, before I do that, there's one nice thing I want to show the AR toolkit does. You'll notice here, I've got in my scene in my 3D preview window, I've got this stones outline. So this is showing me where uh, the where everything is going to go relative to this tracked this tracked object, so it makes it really easy to position things uh, and know where they're going to show up. Um, however, one thing that that AR Toolkit makes diff difficult is for whatever reason, uh, that by default the the scale of everything is very very small. So you'll see, see when I pull my scene in here, it's enormous compared to compared to the tracked object. So I need to rectify that. I'm going to pull that down into my scene root. All right. And push it, position it at the origin. Uh, and set the scale to something I think around here it'll do. Let's see. Yeah, that's better. Uh, another thing that's interesting is the origin actually in AR Toolkit is in the bottom left as opposed to the center of the object. So I'm going to move that to the center. Also, you notice it's kind of oriented. I, I'm, for this one, I want my, uh, my, my picture frame to be parallel to the, uh, to the paper. Uh, it's really up to you how you want it oriented. I, I, for, for me, I wanted it uh, parallel, so I'm going to change the rotation of that. 90 degrees. So now, and I'll actually bump that up a bit. It's a little small. Let's try this. Oops. How's that? That looks pretty good. There. All right. Close enough. So now, and now we've got our scene running. We've got our, uh, a scene, our scene set up. Now, now we're ready to actually pull the trigger and see something happen. Um, so uh, one, one great thing that AR Toolkit has that not every toolkit has is you can do a live preview of your scene, what it's going to look like on your phone before you even install it on the phone. So I'm going to press play here, and assuming that uh, I didn't miss a step, uh, which anyone who's a developer knows is very common, uh, I'm going to get a beach ball, of course. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. All right. Have no fear. I have a backup. <laughs> All right. There we 
we go. So luckily we at least got through all the setup. Okay, bear with me. Sorry about that. Let's hope this one works. Play. All right, there I am. So if I hold this up, there's my scene. And I can show you what that looks like on the phone. Can we switch to the phone? Please, Gregory. There we go. Say cheese. Oh. Ow, they say ow. There's my scene. Okay. And uh, just for fun, I didn't really show this part, but uh, we've got some. Uh, yeah, let me just lay that down there. Oops. Static pipe's no fun. We want that thing to light on fire. So, let's see here. I'll shoot it. Oh, man. There we go. We'll shoot that puppy with a match. All right. Light up. Light up, you. There we go. In the goal. All right, there we go, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm a developer, not an artist, okay? Give me, a, give me some slack here. All right, uh, all right. So that's, uh, that's essentially AR Toolkit. Um, how are we doing on time, about halfway through? Okay, I think we're doing good. Uh, one thing uh, I'll say now uh, about, uh, we're not co uh, completely done. Once you, once you actually build and I'm not going to show that because it takes like three, four minutes. Uh, but once you build, you will notice that the first time you build, you're going to get a ton of compile errors. Um, and that's because um, uh, there's uh, libraries that AR Toolkit needs. Um, and some of the toolkits do this for you, and they're very nice about it. Point Cloud here uh, actually uh, is the nicest, I would say. They actually provide a post-process build script that will take all these missing libraries and any library that the toolkit needs and configure that in your Xcode project for you. Uh, in the case of most every other one, uh, except I think Qualcomm's an, another exception, uh, except for some reason they're missing one .h file. Um, uh, you have to go in and manually uh, go to your Xcode project, and I'll show you what that looks like really quick, uh, although if you've done any kind of iPhone development, you've, you've seen this before. Uh, but for completion, um, you're going to go to your your project settings, your targets, you're going to go to the build phases, and uh, right here in this link with, link with libraries, you're going to hit this little plus button, and you're going to go and find all the libraries that are on the list for the particular toolkit you're using. Make sure they're in your project, and then from there, you should only have to do this once, and every time you rebuild, you're fine, as long as you're um, appending to the project as opposed to rebuilding it. All right. Okay, so moving on to Vuforia. Did um, anyone have any questions at this juncture? Go ahead. So you just had a single image. Yeah, that was a single image. And how many images that count one overlay several images you can see that? Um, I use AR Toolkit, uh, I forget the numbers. Uh, most of them will let you do, you know, up to a dozen or so. Some will, some will even do hundreds. Um, uh, it's different for the, I, I, I would have to go back to my note. I can't remember exactly how many, what, like, what's the cutoff limit for AR Toolkit? In the tens, yeah, for sure. Uh, and, and with the, with the marker tracking, it's even higher. Um, you can do dozens. Um, but I'm not sure for, an, for natural feature how many you can do it simultaneously. Um, and actually, that, that you, you know, now that you said that, that's, that's one thing I did want to show. Um, you'll notice, when I'm doing, uh, if I go to the scene, see, there's my camera. You'll notice that the camera is what's moving. 
So in the case of AR Toolkit, they're moving the camera. Now there's two ways you can do this. You can either move the camera around the scene to, make, to, look, to look at you know, uh, the scene, or you can keep the camera still and move, you know, move the, uh, the objects. Um, in this case, AR Toolkit has, has chosen to move the camera. So you have all these different virtual cameras. So if I had two objects that I'm, uh, uh, that two, two, cameras, uh, two objects that I'm tracking, you would have a different camera in the scene for each, and it would be. Yeah, yeah, you can map each image to whatever you want. Yeah. Well, are you happy with the tracking quality? Can you do other stuff like bending the paper, occluding the paper? Can you do this kind of uh, Yeah, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty robust to occlusions. Uh, as well as bends. Yeah, most of them are. Um, not so bad. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold, hold questions so I can get re through the rest of them, uh, but hold that for, the, for afterward. OK, so now I'm going to move on to uh, Vuforia. Uh, Vuforia has a, a few fewer steps, uh, which is nice. So, but we're going to do, it's going to look fairly similar. Uh, first, I'm going to open uh, another project. Which is uh, empty. Okay. All right. So Cheat uh, right. So, like we did before, we're going to import a package. In this case, uh, before you. And again, we're going to import everything. And uh, when uh, remember at the top of the presentation, I said this. You know, usually when you're about when you're uh, new to a toolkit, you'll run the examples. Usually the samples ship with the package as well. So with AIR Toolkit, we were taking scripts and adding them to objects that we created. In the case of Vuforia, most of what they do is morph through prefabs, uh, which is nice, which means you just kind of drag them into the scene. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, replace this main camera with uh, a camera that uh, Vuforia uh, supplies called an AR camera, aptly named. Um, and, uh, and then I'm also going to add an image target prefab. Uh, so they made things uh, all pretty uh, self-explanatory and intuitive. So I've got my image target, I've got my AR tool camera. Those are kind of the, the, the two main objects. Uh, and then you add your content to the image target. Right now, there's not, the, the image target hasn't been uh, configured, but I'll go ahead uh, and throw my little pipe game onto this image target. And then um, the next thing you do is you've got to, tra again, train the target. In this case, we're going to go to Vuforia's website to do this. It's not a command line. It looks like this. You go to the developer portal at Vuforia, and you upload an image. Uh, in this case, I've uploaded my Stones image already. Um, and uh, da, da, da. oh, I've got to log back in. Okay, because uh, there's a, <coughs> no, of course. All right, there we go. All right, so I've, uh, I've already done it, but what I, well, uh, let me show you uh, a little bit how that works. Um, if I hadn't already done it, you, you basically click this Add Target button, and they get this nice little dialogue. You give the target a name. Uh, you, give it, you can track a single image, a cube, a cuboid. 
uh, which is a, a cube and cuboid are a set of images. In this case, we'll do a single image. You give it a width, and then it figures out the, the length based on the image you upload. Um, and interesting, the, the, the units are scene units. Uh, so you're telling Vuforia how many scene units uh, is this image wide? And so basically that means you've got to go and do some math and figure out, okay, well, if my image is eight inches wide and my scene units are, you know, 20 per inch, um, what do I put in this dialogue? I, you know, it, it, depending on whether you're trying to do like uh, real world accurate uh, uh, imagery, this may or may not matter to you. You might just choose the width of the image in pixels and just call it a day. So anyway, so once you've done that, you're going to go and you're going to download it's going to go and create on the on the cloud. It's going to create a set of feature uh, points, and the nice thing is they actually give each image that you upload a rating, and you can show the features that Vuforia found uh, in this image, uh, and so you can tell which which areas of the image are feature rich, which images are not, and if you actually have control over your images, you can say, well, uh, we got to add some more detail over here. Uh, so that it's more trackable. And they'll give you a fi uh, five star rating on how trackable it is. Um, no surprise, the image that they create, that they provide with the toolkit is very trackable. Um, so then uh, once you've done that, once you've uploaded it, you're going to go ahead and download uh, that, uh, those, that, that target imagery. Uh, in this case, we're going to choose Unity Editor, give it a name, um, and then it'll start downloading that database. Um, I've actually already done, done that earlier. And that's in my boilerplate again. So I'm going to, uh, wait, did I hit the, yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm going to import this package. And this package contains uh, a couple of files. It's got an XML descriptor, uh, which you actually can edit to tell Vuforia that size of the imagery and mapping of, uh, et cetera, and some, uh, some black box data about the future points, et cetera. And then this nice image, which we'll see what it uses that for uh, in a second. Um, so, uh, don't tell me I'm getting, okay, there we go, great. Okay, so we've got our image target. So now you'll notice our image target script has a couple drop downs to tell uh, Vuforia which data set. And, you can, and Vuforia supports multiple data sets, uh, to your question from earlier. You can also track multiple images with Vuforia. And you can actually download, uh, you can actually uh, swap them at runtime, which is nice. Um, so I'm going to choose my AR Showcase data set and the target image of stones. Um, and now, uh, what else do I got to do here? Okay, did that, did that. Ah, yes, okay. On my AR camera, um, kind of similar to what we do with AR Toolkit, there's sort of the, the loading of the data set and then there's choosing of the data set. So we did the choosing of the data set. Now in the AR camera, we're gonna do the, the loading of the data set. So we're gonna tell, we're gonna tick this mark here, go ahead and load the AR uh, show, uh, showcase data set and activate it uh, on, on load. All right, so we've done that. Next, I think we're done. Okay, now we can build and run. Do, do, do. Yeah, all right. And again, uh, Vuforia uh, is also very nice in that they let you do a live preview within Unity without having to load it on your phone. So, all right. Ah, oh. uh, yes, there. Okay, there it is. And you'll notice it's not oriented the same way I had it oriented for the AR toolkit. So let's fix that. Um, I guess the other nice thing is I can actually move things around. If you're not familiar with Unity as an environment, the nice thing is it lets you uh, play with the live data. So, uh, so in real time, I can figure out, okay, well, where do I want this thing? I can scale it, I, you know, I can scale it down, get it to the right values, and then I can plug those into my scene. Keep in mind, though, that uh, if you're not familiar with Unity, you may expect that those data uh, data val uh, values will stay, they will not. When you're in play mode, all of this is basically throwaway. This is just kind of playing around with the data to see what looks right. <laughs> then what I usually do is take a screenshot of the settings that I ended up with so that I can repunch them in later when I go out of play mode. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think there are actually some, uh, some things you can download from the asset store that will let you uh, not, do, not have to do that manually, but anyway. 
so actually, you know what? Uh, we've already seen me do that once with the uh, AR toolkit, like rearrange this thing and get it to the right perspective. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bore you with that again. Uh, so, th but I did want to uh, note a couple of things about uh, Vuforia, um, uh, which is when we look at the um, the the image target. Um, do, do, uh, actually, no. Sorry. When you look at the um, AR camera, it has these, this drop down here, which is the world center mode. And why is that important? Uh, you notice when I, uh, when we talked about AR toolkit, the camera was always the thing moving. With with uh, Vuforia, they give you a choice. They say, well, you can either have uh, the center of the world be this plane, and the camera moves around it, and this never moves, or you can have the camera be fixed and everything in the scene moves, all the t image targets. And why is that important? Well, if you're doing anything with gravity, for instance, like I was flicking matches at this thing, maybe I always want gravity to go down the page. Or maybe I want to involve the accelerometer and figure out which, which is real gravity and I want to do that. Um, it's nice having that option uh, in the toolkit to let you define where, you know, what's the ground truth. Um, and not all the toolkits do that. Uh, so in the, in the case of Euphoria, uh, you have auto, which means that it takes the first target that it finds, and that's, that's the world center, and everything moves around it. Um, and then uh, there's, there's none, which means the camera uh, uh, is fixed, and everything else moves in relation to the camera. Uh, or you can, uh, you can choose a particular trackable to always be the, the ground truth, regardless of which one's picked up first. Okay. Uh, I think that's everything I wanted to say about before you. How are we doing on time? All right, 15 minutes. I think we're doing good. All right. Next, we're gonna, I'm going to do a couple demos on SLAM, uh, Simultaneous Localization and Mapping, where we're building a point cloud of the world in real time. Uh, and again, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the differences here uh, in, in terms of orientation and ground truth. So in the case of point cloud, and if I say anything either, you know, that <laughs> is mistaken, please correct me. Uh, point cloud creates the ground plane from a, a set of points that it finds in, in the environment, and it tries to construct a plane, and it's assuming that you're looking at, you know, a planar object uh, or something that some, uh, some semblance of a plane, and then it, it reports that back to Unity, and that's, that's sort of your ground plane. Uh, in the case of Mateo, it takes a collection of points, and then I, I'm not exactly sure which, uh, which or, which, uh, they, how they choose the origin. I think it's probably in the middle of the cluster of points, and then every, and then the scene gets aligned to gravity. They take, they take into account the, the accelerometer data and the, uh, the magnetometer data, rather, uh, and they figure out what gravity is, and then your scene is nicely aligned with gravity. Now, I'm not saying one's better than the other. I have found the Mateo uh, a little easier to deal with for some things because a lot of times you want to align things to the real world. Uh, the point cloud uh, mechanism uh, I'm sure could work well for, some, for a game where you always want the game to happen on this sheet of paper, for instance. You don't care what gravity is, this is gravity. So I could see an argument for both. Um, it would be nice if both provided either. Um, I'm sure in the next releases they will, or some release they will, hopefully. Um, so let's go ahead and see what it's like to set up SLAM, um, uh, starting with Point Cloud. You notice the few number of steps with Point Cloud. It's really nice to work with. Um, okay, so we're going to start again with our empty, empty scene. got this empty scene here. What I'm, uh, what I'm going to do first is again import the, the point cloud uh, point cloud package.
Um, you may have noticed that said beta. For a beta product, it's actually uh, pretty nice. Uh, there, the, um, I believe, Oscar, you're going to talk about the, the non-unity. Yeah. So uh, that's, uh, I think, a little more mature. All right, so I've import, I'm importing my package, um, and I'm going to add a, um, a point cloud behavior script to my camera. Cloud behavior, there we go, this guy. So I'm going to add that to my camera, and that's going to initialize the point cloud system. Uh, and then I'm going to find, I'm going to create a, um, a scene root for my content. And I'm going to drag a point cloud scene route script. All right. And it's got this little, t the default script uh, hides the, the content uh, when there's no tracking, which is generally what, uh, what you tend to want to do. Um, it's not always, but it's a nice default. Okay, so now we want to create a script to initialize SLAM. Um, I've actually uh, taken the... Um, uh, where is it? Oh, yeah. uh, there's a default uh, script that comes uh, with Point Cloud. I, I just tweaked it to my liking. Uh, you know, a lot of times you'll want to initialize uh, your SLAM mapping with a button, for instance. Um, and I'm going to grab that from here. Uh, this is my auto initialize Point Cloud. It's not. It actually doesn't differ that much from the uh, the default script. Uh, and I'll just, uh, oh, oops, I'll just add that to my project under scripts here. All right, and I'll create another empty object to hold that. And very quickly, we'll take a look at what that script does. It doesn't do much. Um, but uh, just uh, tell Point Cloud to go ahead and generate uh, a SLAM map. Uh, there it is. Um, okay, so it's basically I, I just create a button, reset SLAM. When, I, uh, when that gets hit, it, uh, it tells the Point Cloud instant to reset itself. And then there's a, uh, a callback that you get on Point Cloud state changed. And, and when you get that event, then uh, you can uh, you can and and point clouds in the idle state, which is what you know goes through a number of states, training, etc. Uh, when it's in the idle state, go ahead and start start slam mapping. Uh, all right, so I've done that. Oh, and then here's the here's the first uh, toolkit uh, uh, where we have to actually uh, give a, a um, an application key. So what I'm going to do is go uh, to where is that? Uh, do, 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 do. Point cloud menu, where is it? Okay, there we go. So they give this nice little menu here. I can request a key, and that'll go off to their website where I can generate an application key for my, for my um, application. I log in. Um, I've already done this, but you just basically give that uh, the, your app ID, uh, which is your bundle, idea from bef bundle ID from before, uh, and that's this one here. AWT tutorial point cloud. So I punch that into this app ID. I hit generate. They generate an app ID. I mean an app key. I'm just going to copy and paste that into my project. All right, right up here. Save it. And I believe I'm done. Um, so I'm just going to build and run. Um, any any questions while this is building? Do you want to get to your question? If you have a tar well, the question was if you have a target already and you have the content? Yes. Uh, how long does it take to create the app? Well, uh, as long as this, you know, it depends on uh, what else is the app needs to do. Uh, I mean, if it all it is is literally like put some, you know, put a video on a marker or something like that, it doesn't take long at all. Um, 
you know, you have, if you're going through the iOS App Store, then obviously you have to wait for approval from Apple. Uh, you want to do some, some user testing. Um, you know, there's the figuring out what it is you want to do. So, but yeah, if you, if you have existing content that, and, and everything's already done, then yeah, it shouldn't take long at all. Uh, okay, so uh, the, one, the reason I wanted to build that is you'll notice, um, I'm going to rebuild. I don't know if everybody, I, I didn't see it happen, but uh, uh, with Point Cloud, what's nice is I didn't have to change any, uh, anything about this project that got generated by Unity. It just worked. Awesome. Nice work. Um, and so uh, I've got that sample. I'll load up here in just a sec. Uh, can we switch to the iPhone, please? All right. So I'm going to hit this uh, reset slam button that I showed you. And uh, with Point Cloud, what it's doing is, I, I don't even know if you can see the little sparkles. There's little sparkles it creates. Um, and you move the phone back and forth and, and forward and back, and, it's, and it made a map of the world uh, so that and you can see it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty solid. Um, in this case, uh, I, you know, kind of got lucky. It looks like it's aligned to gravity uh, pretty pretty well. Um, and then I can uh, shoot my little matches at my pipe and light it up. Uh, if I want to track something else, I hit the reset slam. And now it's tracking this area over here. And you'll notice now it's a little so it'll it'll stay it'll stay there now. Um, so that's that's point cloud. All right. Uh, yeah, it's markerless. It's it's just basically reading the the features of a particular of the three D space. Um, uh, we're running. A, we start a little late, so we're running a little low on time. So I think I'm gonna go quickly through the Mateo uh, tutorial uh, and maybe not do the entire thing and just show the output. Let's see. Do, do, do. What do I want to say about it? That's. Um, okay. Yeah, I think I'll just. Uh, I'll just show what that one looks like. It's uh, Siri not available. Siri's not available. Okay. No. No. Okay. Can we go back to the um can you go back to the iPhone please? Okay. Uh, so in the case of Mateo, um, as I said before earlier, now they, they're, they're, the way they do the tracking is, is more that like you pull it from right to left, or yeah, right to left, and it uh, oops, it shows these kind of little X sparkles to tell you where it's uh, finding stuff. And okay. So far in our apples to apples here, Point Cloud is doing a little better at finding the thing. Let's try the keyboard. There we go. Okay, found it. Where is it? There we go. Oh. <coughs> Shoot. Try again. There we go. Okay. Uh, notice, like I said before, it's pretty much. You know, I'm holding my phone straight down. It's pretty much aligned to, to gravity. Uh, the scale, that's just a, just a function of, of the, the size of the thing that you're tracking. Um, and, all right. So these are the steps uh, if you're going to try it at home. This is what uh, this is. This is the steps for uh, setting up your Mateo um, 
instant 3D. Uh, one, of the, one of the things to note is uh, they provide an instant tracking script out of the box uh, that's instant 2D. Uh, you want to change that to instant 3D if you want to do 3D slam tracking. Um, and again, they have the missing Xcode uh, libraries, so you've got to go do that. Uh, okay. And they also have a, uh, an application ID that you need to generate, kind of similar to Point Cloud. You, you plug it in, and then that tells Mateo that you are legit. Okay. I'll talk very briefly about some other rendering options. All of the tutorials that I showed today were Unity-based. Uh, Unity is a nice environment, but uh, you may want to use something <coughs> else. Maybe you're an OpenGL hack and you love that environment. Uh, or you're on a different a device that uh, Unity doesn't support, um, then you're probably going to be using something like OpenGL. Some of the toolkits provide uh, an HTML and JavaScript and XML interface, uh, like 13th Lab has an HTML option. Uh, Mateo has their AREL, Augmented Reality Expression Language, I think. Um, Wikitude uh, provides an HTML, and I'm sure they're going to go through a tutorial and show you that. Um, and then if you're not a programmer or you have a friend that's not a programmer, uh, there are a bunch of uh, tools out there that will let you do augmented reality experiences, uh, generally a little uh, uh, less, um, uh, you're going to have a little less control and you're most likely going to be targeting their browser platforms. Uh, so uh, I'll, just put, I'll just throw these out there as something, so, as some you might want to check out or have your friends check out if they're not programmers and, but they still want to. Uh, play with augmented reality. Uh, there's the Mateo uh, Creator. Uh, there's Layar has a product called Creator um, as well. There's Orasma Studio. Uh, AR Code has a, to, uh, a, cam a what's called a cloud, cloud campaign editor. I actually haven't seen this one because I haven't signed up for that one. And uh, I hope I'm not stealing anybody's thunder, but uh, Wikitude has a, a, a product called Studio coming out. So uh, that's, uh, that's all I had. Uh, I will take uh, five minutes to quest for questions while the next uh, speaker's coming up to, uh, to get set up. Anybody have any uh, questions? Yeah, in the back. Uh, the question was whether the slides will be made available. Yes, I will make the slides available. Sure. On the on the Qualcomm Ufuri, you already use the target. That, he, that that has a stone pebbles, right? Whatever the user right, target. Yeah. Suppose if you want to create your own target, let's say I want to make that as a target. Yeah, yeah, you can so do that. What I is the procedure? That it, is oh, the procedure involved in there? Or for which which platform? For Qualcomm or for Well, for Qualcomm, it's the same process that I showed, where you, you just go to the website, um, uh, you upload it. In this case, like for instance, you can upload a dollar bill image that you create, take, or you take, you know, whatever image you have, you upload it. Um, you, you know, you click the Add Target button. You choose a file from your uh, from your from your PC, and then it ships that off to the cloud, and it trains, and then it comes back and tells you this will work, this won't work. Not every image is trackable. Um, in the back. Oh, um, you, know, you know, when I was saying HTML5 and JavaScript, there, there actually are, uh, the question was whether HTML and JavaScript can, can perform as well. Um, I don't have any specific numbers on the HTML5 rendering. Uh, I mean, usually, yeah, oh, the tr oh. Oh, 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 right, right, right. <coughs> yeah, um, that's, that's right now, uh, HTML5 is, is still very immature when it, uh, when it comes to, like, standards for actually getting a hold of the camera and stuff like that. I mean, I have seen the JSR toolkit. Um, uh, it's, it's a fiducial marker tracking, and it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty performant. Uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't played with any, any NFT-based JavaScript libraries yet. I mean, it, it's kind of... It's kind of to, in my mind, it's still a little early in, in, uh, to be targeting uh, HTML and JavaScript for the actual tracking 
code, but um, you know, in, unless you're using an SDK that already, you know, uses that for rendering. So, yeah. And by the way, we can get the next speaker up to set your laptop. Are there any sites out there that do objective measurements and comparisons between the different uh, SDKs, oh, like uh, on latency, accuracy, et cetera? Uh, there's, there's, there's this site here. Um, I don't know why I won't go to that tab. Uh, it's called Social, oh, because I got this. Uh, Social Compare. Um, I mean, it's, it's more like wiki-based, like people upvote and vote down. Um, but in terms specifically of performance, um, I'm not aware um, of, of, of a resource that specifically has done like apples to apples performance comparisons. I had wanted to do some of that for this for this talk, uh, but um, just <laughs> confession, I didn't I didn't get to it. And, and also, it's it's a it's a hard thing to set up and make sure that you're not being uh, that you actually have the environment set up in a sort of clean room way that uh, that you're doing in a true apples to apples um, so but anyway short answer no not that I know uh, go ahead uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All, um, yeah, all the apps. You can you can do either either way. I mean, if you're doing cloud recognition, obviously you can't be offline to do that. Uh, if you've pre-trained your targets, uh, it gets baked into the app, and you can use it offline, no problem. Yeah. yeah I'm thinking also is uh, all the models, uh, all the content. Yeah, all the content can be baked in. Obviously, you know, you you want okay. if it's mobile, you want to be cognizant of app size. Uh, so that you know people don't have to wait forever to get the app on their phone, but yeah, you can bake as much content as you want into the app, and not have to download it over the network. Okay. It's really up to you as a developer, or or, or really probably the product manager uh, is dictating whether they want that content to be evergreen and coming from the network, or whether it's you know pre-baked and canned, and they can deal with the file sizes. Yeah. 